So we've talked about the general concept of what a limit is. And we saw that for a number of functions, just being able to plug in the number into the function to get our limit makes them pretty easy. But it, unfortunately, it can't always be done that way. And in fact, when we can't do it is the times when the concept of limit gets the most interesting. If we, if we didn't have the, the, these other situations where we can't plug in the number, then what's the whole point of bringing up this concept in the first place? So let's say we have a function f of x that is defined near a c, but it, where, near an x equals c, but not at c itself. Can we find that the limit at c? Well, one idea is what if we can show that f is equal to some other function g, where c, where g is defined near c. And I should say um, x near, but not equal to c. Well, if this is true, because we're not really, we don't really care when we're taking the limit about what is the value of the function at c, if this is true, then the limit of f of x as x goes to c is equal to the limit as x goes to c of g of x. If g is actually defined at c and f is not, then maybe we could use the value of g at c to actually find this limit. Let's see how that l works by looking at the first example that we had on, on, on the last video. So again, we are looking at the limit as x goes to 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. We saw before by just plugging in numbers that were close to 1, plugging in various x values, that this limit should be 2. We got numbers that are really close to 2. But let's prove that that, that is actually true by manipulating this function x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 into something that's easier to work with. Specifically, we can note that x squared minus 1 is factorable. This quadratic it can be factored into x minus 1 times x plus 1. Notice this is what we call a difference of squares. It's x squared minus 1 squared. Therefore, if I divide this by x minus 1, well, we can kind of see here that the x minus 1s can cancel out. And so this is really just equal to x plus 1. Now, of course, technically there, this, this is true for x not equal to 1, but it is, tr but it is true for any other x values. As long as x is not 1, so that the x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, that this even makes any sense, then it's always equal to x plus 1. This actually should not be too much of a surprise. We, we already were graphing the function x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, and we saw that it looks like a line. That's because it really is the line y equals x plus 1, just it's missing the point at 1. There should be a, like, a little open circle here that GeoGebra doesn't show for us. So, I kept wanting to call it a line, but that's just because it really was. But the point here is the limit as x goes to 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, because for any point other than, than the c value, the c equals 1, this, this function here is just equal to x plus 1, I can go ahead and replace it. These two limits are the same thing. And x plus 1 is now just a polynomial. This function is defined at 1. I can go ahead and plug in 1, get 1 plus 1, or the 2 that we expected. And really, when we, whenever we deal with what we call a rational function here, so I probably should go ahead and define that for us. We'll, we'll talk about these somewhat frequently. A rational function 
This is just a polynomial divided by another polynomial. Whenever we have something like this, it's a good idea to see if things can factor. And in fact, a lot of times we can actually simplify what we have to something that we can actually take a limit of by doing that factorization. Let's look at another example of this. Let's look at problem 42. Here we're going to take the limit as x goes to negative 3. Our top function is x cubed plus 27. Then we divide that by x plus 3. First thing I would like to do here, before I even try to do any factorization, is see if I can plug in the number. If I can plug in negative 3, then that's probably my answer, and I don't really have to do much more. In fact, when, we'll, we'll discuss in the next section how for rational functions, if we can plug in the number, it will give us the right answer every time. So, might as well try to plug in the, the negative 3. If I try to plug in negative 3, what happens? Well, the, the most obvious thing here is that x plus 3 on the bottom gives me a 0. It actually turns out putting negative 3 into the top gives us 0 as well. So, it's kind of, it kind of broke. I mean, we, we need to do something different. We can't use, we can't use the rules that we had from the last last video to just immediately give us our answer. We need to try something different. Of course, the what I showed before, we try to factor it. In fact, the fact that x, x cubed plus 27 does give us 0 when we plug in negative 3 kind of implies already that x plus 3 is a factor of that. It might take you some more time to actually come up with the second factor. It turns out the other factor is x squared minus 3x plus 9. If you don't believe me, we can you can go ahead and expand this out. Take x times each of these terms. That, get, that definitely gives us an x cubed term, but it also gives us two other terms. If I then go ahead and multiply every term by 3 as well, we get these first two terms involving x's and, and the 3, but then we also get a plus 27. Turns out all the all the terms, the other terms I didn't actually explicitly give you, will cancel each other out. We'll, do, we'll just be left with that first x cubed term and that last 27 term. So go ahead and try that for yourself. If I go ahead and divide this by the x plus 3, of course... The whole point here is that those x plus 3s cancel each other out. If that didn't happen, then we couldn't do anything more. I'll show you something where that where that's the problem later on. So we're left with x squared minus 3x plus 9. And so the limit that we're looking for is the same as the limit as x goes to negative 3 of x squared minus 3x plus 9. This is now a polynomial. It's a quadratic. We can plug negative 3 into that quadratic and see what we get. Negative 3 squared is 9. Minus 3 times negative 3, well the negatives cancel out there, and we just end up with a 9. And finally, the limit of 9 is still 9. So 9 plus 9 plus 9 gives us 27. That is the limit of this function at negative 3. And if we, if we want to, we could go ahead and graph this and see, see how that works. So recall the function here was x cubed plus 27 divided by x plus 3. Kind of a big, big one up here. As you can kind of already see here, it does look like a parabola. It is a parabola. I mean, we, we showed that as long as we're not at negative 3, we do have a quadratic. If we go ahead and put the line at x equals negative 3, because that's where we want to take the limit. Of course, that way up here, but it definitely does hit that graph at 27. In fact, we could go ahead and 
put the point, negative 327, and it is on on our curve. Technically, well, technically it is not a point on the curve because that we, we have a hole in our graph there. Because, that's, because the function is not defined for negative 3. It is defined for the parabola, though. It's on the parabola. It's not technically on our function f. Just because we have to exclude it from our domain, because in some ways we have a, a slightly faulty uh, formula for our, for our function. We can even use this idea for some more complicated expressions. Let's take something like problem 48. Here we're taking the limit as x goes to 3. We still have a fraction, the bottom here being x minus 3, but the top is more complicated. We have a square root of x plus 1 minus 2. If we were to try to plug in 3, obviously the bottom is equal to 0. But the top actually equals 0 as well. 3 plus 1 gives us a 4, we get a 2. 2 minus 2 gives us a 0. In fact, this, this idea of 0 over 0 is something we're going to be seeing fairly often. It's something we call an indeterminate form. We call it that because whenever we're dealing with a fraction and taking the limit of the fraction and we get 0 over 0, that means it could be potentially just about anything. With just being able to plug in the value and get 0 over 0 doesn't tell us much about the function at all. But it, does, it will allow us to do certain tricks later on. But, it, but these are going to be fairly common for us. If we had something like 1 over 0, that would tell us something about the function. Because 1 over 0, well, I'll get into that a little bit later. But it, it, it kind of, it does tell us something about what the function is doing around that c value. When, it, when we get 0 over 0, though, it, do, it really doesn't tell us anything. So we're going to have to take this function, and we're going to have to do some algebra tricks to change this function so that we don't have this, this problem. This is a trick that, I'm going to use a trick that we sometimes call rationalization. Or we're going to say multiply by the conjugate. But it essentially boils down to me looking at this, this top the top of my fraction, my square root of x plus 1 minus 2, and essentially taking that and changing the, the minus sign to a plus sign. And then I'm going to multiply this fraction on top and bottom by that, by that expression. So we, we still have our, our function, but I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the top, where I change that minus sign to a plus sign. And the reason I do that is actually very similar to what we had back here. x squared minus 1 became x minus 1 and x plus 2, sorry, x minus 1 and x plus, plus 1. Because this is a difference of squares. Essentially, we're saying here that a squared minus b squared is the same thing as a plus b times a minus b. But I'm actually going the opposite way. Here I have a minus b and a plus b, and so ultimately I get a squared minus b squared. Well, if my a is the square root of x plus 1, then a squared is just going to be x plus 1. And then my b is 2, so b squared is 4. On the bottom, well, I'm, I'm not actually going to change the bottom very much. I just still have the x minus 3 and the square root of x plus 1 plus 2. Or, sorry, that should be a plus 2. I'm just going to leave it that way. 
The idea here being, though, that the top now simplifies. The top actually becomes an x minus 3. And we can then go ahead and cancel the x minus 3 on top and the x minus 3 on the bottom. That will just leave me with a 1 on top. And the bottom becomes a square root of x plus 1 plus 2. That means that the limit of my original function, as x goes to 3, is the same thing as the limit, as x still goes to 3, of this new function. Now, I haven't guaranteed yet that I can go ahead and plug in 3, but this actually turns out to be true. So, if I plug in 3 here, square root of, well, let's just go ahead and write it out. We have 3 plus 1 plus 2. Square root of 3 plus 1, well, that's square root of 4. Square root of 4 is 2. So, we have 1 over 2 plus 2, which is just 1 over 4. So, probably wouldn't have guessed it from our original expression up here, the original function, that the limit as x goes to 3 of this function is 1 fourth. But it does turn out to be true. We just had to do a bunch of algebra in order to get there. Unfortunately, we can't always evaluate limits in that way. Let's look at some other possibilities. We're going to look at the limit as x goes to 0 of the absolute value of x divided by x. This particular function is definitely not defined for x equals 0. If I try to plug in 0 for x, well, the bottom becomes 0, the top actually becomes 0 as well. So this is not defined for x equals 0. So how does it actually behave near 0? Well, let's get an idea by looking at its graph. So my function here is the absolute value. We can actually just put in abs, and it will automatically change that to an absolute value. So the absolute value function looks like a v, if you remember. But I'm going to divide that by x. And I get this kind of graph. Note here that at 0, it, it kind of jumps. But, it, but away from 0, it's just a, a horizontal line. But that jump at 0 kind of suggests a problem. If we put a number near 0 into our function, it, we get wildly different answers depending on whether or not we have a positive value, in which case we're getting, we're getting numbers that are close to 1. Or if we put a negative number, we get a number that's really close to negative 1. In fact, saying close to is, is not even fair here because we do either get 1 or negative 1. If we go ahead and pick numbers that are close to close to 0, we could put in something like a negative 1, negative 0 0.1, negative 0 0.01. Those all give me an exact value of negative 1. Remember there, we're, we're putting, say, for negative 1, we have a positive 1 on top and a negative 1 on bottom. When we divide those, we get negative 1. When we put in negative 0 0.1, we have positive 0 0.1 on, on top we have a negative 0 0.1 on bottom. The 0 0.1s cancel out, but we still have that negative sign. So we always get negative, negative 1 on this side. On the other hand, if we're going to pick positive numbers that are getting closer to 0, well, when I plug 1 in there, I get 1 over 1, or 1. When I put 0 0.1 in there, I get 0 0.1 over 0 0.1. I still get 1. In fact, I get all 1's over here. These values are not approaching the same thing at all. This limit does not exist. We have to be approaching one particular number, or we don't have a limit. However, this example does bring up a possibility. It does really seem like we, we are approaching things, but only when we look at one side or the other. If we're only looking at positive values, it looks like it's certainly going to 1. But if we're only looking at negative values, it certainly looks like we should be going to negative 1. We call these one-sided limits.
we'll say that the limit as x goes to 0 from the positive side, or positive or right side, of, x, of the absolute value of x over x is a positive 1. Because as long as we're staying on the positive side of 0, we are definitely going to 1. On the other hand, if we're going on the negative side of 0, if we're looking at only negative numbers, if we're approaching from the left, then the absolute value of x over x seems to be approaching negative 1, or it seems to be staying at negative 1. We can use these, we can do these in a little bit more generality. So in general, we can talk about the one side limit as x goes to c from the right or from the positive side of f of x is equal to some limit l. Maybe we'll call this l1. So we can say this from the right or from the positive side. We only use x's that are bigger than c. On the other hand, if we come from the left, we, we're still saying it's from the negative side or the, or the left side of our function is some L2. This is our left-hand limit. Here we only use x's that are less than c. So as long as we, as long as we look at one side or the other, we can actually talk about limits in this case even though we technically don't have a limit of the entire function. It turns out that these limits are definitely related to the normal limit. Basically, there you have a theorem here. The limit as x goes to c of f of x is equal to L if and only if both one side limits equal L. What that means is that if we do have a limit, if we if this limit does equal L, then the limit as x goes to c from the positive side equals L, and the limit as x goes to c from the negative side equals L. But most, most often it's actually used to, ba to basically say, well, finding the limit all at once is complicated. How about I try to only take the limit from one side and then I take the limit from the other side. And if I get the same number, then then we have a limit. If I get different numbers, then I don't have a limit. To illustrate this, let's look at problem 53. In problem 53, we have a, a function f of x that is piecewise. We have two pieces to this thing. If x is less than or equal to 3, then our function is 1 third of x minus 5. If, on the other hand, x is bigger than 3, then our function is negative 3x plus 7. Because we have different functions on either side of 3, if we were to take the limit as x goes to 3 of the entire function all at once, it'd be really awkward to to try to find the limit. But it's actually pretty easy to take the limit from each side separately using those one side limits. If I take the limit from the left of my function, it's the same thing as if I only use my formula for what happens on the left. On the left, we're working with x's that are less than 3, so we're definitely in this case of 1 third x minus 5. So really, I'm just taking the limit as x goes to 3 of 1 third x minus 5. Now that is a polynomial, it's a line. So I can go ahead and plug in 3. I get a 1 minus 5, giving me a negative 4. If I take the limit from the positive or the right side, it's the same thing as if I take the limit of the negative 3x plus 5, because this time we're taking the x's that are bigger than 3. 
and again, we just have a line here. This is a polynomial. We can plug in the 3. We have negative 3 times 3 plus 7, or negative 9 plus 7 gives me a negative 2. These are different. To say something like negative 4 does not equal negative 2. I mean, that seems obvious, but the point here is that our, our two one side limits give us different values. And so the limit, this limit here, does not exist. Because it can only exist if both of these give us the same value. That's all that's the point of being able to talk about one side limits. So we can we don't have we can kind of divide up the work. If one side is different from the other side, we don't have to do them all at once. We can do them separately. Now we do have other possibilities. What can happen around a point that's not in the domain of a function? So we talked about the function g of x is equal to x squared minus two over x minus one. And recall we had a graph like this, where at 1, one side of the graph looks like it's getting really big positive numbers, and the other side looks like it's getting really small negative numbers. And so we want to be able to describe this, this kind of behavior. Remember, this, this came from the, the first example of our last video. Let's go ahead and make a, a chart. We'll talk about things happening around 1. So we'll, we'll start off at 0 and 2. At 0, this function gives us a 2. At 2, it also gives us a 2. That's kind of a coincidence. But we can then pick numbers that are closer to 1. So we'll make all the jump all the way to 0 0.9, then 0 0.99, and 0 0.999. We plug in these values into our function. Again, go ahead and use a calculator here just to save us some time. We get 11.9, then 101.99, then 1001.999. So we're getting really, really big numbers. And in fact, they will continue to get bigger and bigger the closer and closer we get to 1. There's actually no pardon the pun, but there's no limit to how big this, this gets. We, we'll actually use the term bound here. The, these, these terms, these uh, values are, are, are unbounded. On the other side, from 2 we'll go to 1.1, then 1.01, and 1.001. We put, in those, put these values into our function, we get a negative 7.9 a negative 97.99 and a negative 997.999. We're getting what would be basically really big numbers, but really big negative numbers. And again, the, these will continue to get bigger and bigger, at least in absolute value, technically smaller and smaller because they're all negative, and they're also unbounded. They, there's there's no limit to how, how small these are getting. There, there's no cap on how big g of x gets when we put in numbers that are smaller than 1, and there's no cap on how, how small g gets when we're looking at numbers that are less than, or sorry, that are bigger than negative 1, or bigger than 1. Sorry, tripping my, over my words here. So technically here, this limit doesn't exist. We're not actually approaching a number here. In fact, even if we look at the one side limits, there, we're not approaching a number. There, it's not settling down anywhere. But the behavior here is kind of specific. That there, we can describe what is happening to our function. And so we want to be able to give a notation for what this, what's, what's actually happening here. What we're going to write is that the limit as x goes to 1, at least, let's say, from the negative side first, the one side limit of our function. In fact, I'm even going to go ahead and write the, the actual formula here. The limit as x goes to negative 1 is infinity. 
We're using the infinity symbol here. This is not actually saying that the limit exists. The limit is not technically in infinity. But this notation here is just telling us that it is continually increasing. It's, it keeps going up and up and up without any cap to it. So this is, this is telling us about the behavior of the function, not necessarily saying that the limit exists somewhere. So technically, technically does not exist is the more correct answer here. It's just equals infinity is a little bit more information than does not exist. On the other hand, if we're going fr from the positive side, we're going to say that's negative infinity. Technically still does not exist, but does not exist in a, spe in a specific way. That it is going to negative infinity, it, it's getting really big negative numbers. Now, of course, since these are not the same thing, infinity and negative infinity are not the same thing, then the limit overall, this whole thing, I can put an equal sign there, this literally just doesn't exist. There, There's technically no, no answer that we can give here that works either way. But this wouldn't be, be true if we were to look at something like we looked at, say, 1 over x squared. We looked at 1 over x squared. If we're coming from, from the negative side, we end up going to infinity. We're getting really, really big po positive numbers. If we come from the positive side, we also get really, really big positive numbers. So in that case, because we, we would have the limit as x goes to 0 from either side, our infinity, Since we get the same result on either side, we would say in overall, the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x squared is infinity. We, we'd say, we categorize all of this under the, under the, the name of infinite limits. But it's just a way of describing what's, what's happening at a particular point even though technically these are new definitions. Technically we, we're defining a brand new type of limit here that we didn't have before. But it, it's just capturing the intuitive ideas that you probably already have worked with whenever you're talking about vertical asymptotes. You probably talked about those back in college algebra, or at least you should have talked about those depending on wh where you took that class. But these are not brand new concepts, this is a, a more formal way of writing it that's going to be very helpful for us when we actually move into calculus. Now there is one last possibility, and it's a little hard to talk about this possibility without really breaking our rule of not using trigonometric functions. Because the, the really best example I know of, the easiest example to work with here, does use trig functions. I'm going to look at the function f of x is equal to the sine of 1 over x. The sine function is a is a trig function. Um, I'll go ahead and graph that function just, just so you can get an idea of what's happening with it. So the sine of x is a, a wave. So sometimes it's referred to as a sine wave. It's just a trig function that constantly alternates between negative 1 and 1 over and over again at all the way to infinity. There's this just constantly going forever and over, ever. If I t were to take sine of 1 over x, what that 1 over x does is it kind of takes all the x values and flips them around 1 and negative 1. Kind of taking everything that was out, back, out at infinity and moving it close to 0 and everything that was close to 0 out to infinity. And what that, the effect of that is, is it takes all these infinitely many waves and kind of compresses them down into a, a small little section here between one, negative 1 and 1. So we get this, this function that is very wild. It's 
technically doing infinitely many oscillations as it goes in from 1 to 0. And the same thing from negative 1 to 0. What would happen if we were to ask, what is the limit of this function as x goes to 0? Well, initially you might think that's a really crazy question, because this graph seems to be flying all over the place. Or at least everywhere between negative 1 to 1. Well, that's because it really is. There is no limit here. There's no limit whatsoever. It just d flat out doesn't exist. At I any number I were to pick in this interval, I can find points, I can find x values that are really, really close to zero that are way far away from it, or at least pretty far away in terms of negative one to one. If I were to say, I want this to go to zero, well, I could find points that are as close to I want to x equals 0, where the value of the function is up here at 0 0.8. No matter how close I want to get to 0, I can find I can find points that are anywhere on this interval that I want to. And, and this time we can't even use something some fancy notation like saying the function goes to infinity or minus infinity. The, the function simply does not approach 1 particular answer. It's kind of approaching the entire interval all at once, and we don't want to have that happen when we talk about limits. So this is this is legitimately a, a situation where where this the limit as x goes to zero of sine of one over x cannot exist in any way, shape, or form. There's there's no not even any way of, of even justifying trying to make it trying to say that the limit is one thing or another of course I'm not going to be asking you to work with with examples like this pretty much at all otherwise I wouldn't have even had to bring up trigonometric functions to give you an example the point I'm trying to make here is that in the wide realm of functions there's a lot of a lot of things that can happen there's a lot of there's functions out there that have really crazy behavior that you might want to be careful for. But most of the functions that we're going to be working with, anything like a, a power of x, a rational function, polynomials, even when we get into exponentials and logarithms, they're relatively nice functions, and we don't have to worry too much about what they're doing. If we come to anything that, that can get a little tricky, I'll let you know. Um, just be careful. Is, is really the only thing I can say there. But I'm going to leave that here. We'll, again, in the next section, we'll actually talk a little bit more about limits. We'll talk about when we can actually just find limits by plugging in numbers. What are some conditions that would make that true? What are some, what are some functions that we can actually get away with that kind of thing and not have to do all this extra stuff? And what is that, ac what is being able to do actually accomplished for us, because there are actually some results that require us to, to be able to plug in the number into our function in order to get our limits. There are definitely some very positive results of being able to do that. But I'm going to leave that for the next video, and I'll see you guys in that one.